Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription really helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Tell, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Seriously, let's do it. All right, let's take care of some housekeeping. In case you didn't see my Halloween special, and why not? Anyway, I didn't pass the advanced sommelier exam. While I did pass the theory portion in April, I only passed the service practical in July. I failed the deductive tasting portion. I've already resumed my studies and have registered to take the theory portion, uh, February 22nd, 2024. I still have to officially pay for that part of the exam, but you have to do an initial registration so they can ensure that you're qualified to take the exam, which I definitely am. I expect to pass theory again, no guarantees of course, but I feel good about where I'm already at and I have a good game plan and preparing for it again. The other two portions of the exam are still in Phoenix in July. Uh, other than that, I've been relaxing the past couple months and I'm ready to get back into studying and making kick-ass content. I'm really excited to make more content. I have a ton of samples to review with a few more on the way. So these episodes over the next four to five months, maybe more, will supplement my studies. These videos, first and foremost, have always been a way for me to study for exams. So with that said, this episode and next episode are Texas wines. And while Texas wines aren't necessarily in the top of the list for things that might happen on my exam, they are still things that I can use for study purposes. And besides, I like Texas wine. All right, so uh, this wine uh, is actually one I purchased rather than a free sample. Now, last November, I got to visit a couple of Texas wineries. This was no ordinary visit. It was put together by the Texas Hill Country Wineries Organization. Now. They organize a few industry-only events throughout the year that sometimes include visits to wineries to, dis to discuss various topics. The purpose of this one, or this visit, was something along the lines of things you wish you knew before you opened a winery. Now, some of the things brought up were things like loading docks and making sure they weren't, like, angled in a way where the street drains into it, uh, or drains in the actual winery, and water permits, and the size of your buildings, and the size of your doorways to make sure you can get equipment through, and then your tasting room design, all kinds of stuff like that. You know, the really sexy stuff. Uh, it wasn't a tasting visit per se, but we did get to taste some wines at one of the wineries. The second winery of that trip was Lost Draw Cellars. It was in their older location in Fredericksburg, Texas. This was interesting since their actual winery is tiny, and I mean really tiny. It's also inside the city, tucked away where no one would see it unless you were looking for it. They also had a tasting room and a small event room. So we got to see and hear about some of the challenges they faced based upon their location and size. One of the things they talked about was their loading dock. Um, they didn't realize at the time they made their loading dock, which was at an angle down, that the street, yeah when it rains, fun stuff. Anyway, since it was the second stop of the day and I had some time to kill before another unrelated industry tasting event back in San Antonio, I decided to hang out in their tasting room since it was open. And it, it usually is. Some, every once in a while, especially early, early in the week, like a Monday or Tuesday, some tasting rooms aren't open, but they're open every day. Well, I tasted a few of the wines and each one was excellent. It was probably one of the first, time I, first times I had had their wines, or at least had them in a long time. Now, this particular wine caught my eye. It's a fairly unusual white blend. Well, at least unusual to me at the time. I've only heard of a blend like this one other time while on an online seminar. But who has lost draw? Well, I'm glad you asked. Details are a little scarce on the website, but I'll give you what I found. And they did kind of go over some of their history when I went there, but that wasn't the purpose of the, the visit. Uh, the property they're located on used to be associated with the oil and gas industry in Texas. Walter Otmers had taken over a company called Gulf Distribution. His son Troy took over in 1987. In 2009, the business was sold, but they kept the land. 
I don't know exactly what Gulf Distribution did. I suspect, I suspect a different oil and gas industry bought them, but didn't keep the name. I found a company with the same name that does beverage distribution in Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi. I couldn't find anything other than that one company. Uh, granted, I also only searched for about 15, 20 minutes. Well, maybe not that long, but you know what I mean. The sale of the company helped fund lost draw sellers. This is where one of the best growers in the state comes in, Andy Timmons. His nephew, Andrew Sides, is married to Troy's daughter. Now, Andrew spent his time during his high school summer breaks on Andy's Vineyard Helping. Summer in Texas is a great time to do this as this is when most of the harvest is done. Now, much of the Northern Hemisphere doesn't start harvest until September, and that's when Texas's harvest is starting to wind down. We do have grapes that are harvested into October but we start our harvest six to eight weeks earlier than most of the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. Anyway, Andrew graduated high school and then went off to college at Texas Tech. He took the traditional nine to fiver, but was quote drawn, see what I did there? So to speak, back to the wine industry. So Andy, Andrew, and Troy all partnered up in 2012 to start Lost Draw Cellars using the property of, old, of the old Gulf Distributing. Now, fast forward to 2021, William Chris Vineyards teams up with Lost Draw to form William Chris Wines. Now, if William Chris sounds familiar, they should. I did an interview many, many years ago with their winemaker and their vineyard manager at the time. William Chris also recently got named as one of the top 100 vineyards in the world. Now, this is still kind of surreal for me, not because I don't believe in William Chris or Texas wine in general, just that it was kind of unexpected. Now, I've been to four of the current 100, including William Chris, several times. I've been by or near several others, and I've had wines from many more. So this is a very high honor for any winery to have. All right, back to Lost Straw. So they occupied this small property for many years. In late 2022, they started doing tastings at a new location in Johnson City. They first planted seven acres of vineyards in 2020. They will have a more proper tasting room and other facilities this year. I don't know how close to finishing they are, as the website doesn't say it's finished, but I think they're pretty close or maybe even finished with the actual tasting room now. I will probably try to visit it uh, later this week. I have something going on that I'll be up in the area, and um, either that Friday I may try to stop by, or on Saturday with a group of people may try to stop by. Anyway... Um, the, the Fredericksburg location is still open. Uh, when I wrote the script, I realized that it didn't make, it made it seem like they closed the Fredericksburg tasting room. Uh, it's still open. I don't know if the winery is still there. I think the winery will be moved to, to Johnson City or has moved to Johnson City. So when I go there, I will hopefully find out more. And I will probably go there before this video comes up. Maybe I'll put a lower third or something. Anyway, this wine though is really interesting. It's a blend of Riesling and Gruner Veltliner. I don't encounter this blend very often, as it never. I heard it mentioned on a Guild Psalm seminar once. The back label mentions this is a classic German blend. Now, it might be, but I don't think I've ever seen one before. It's probably more common in Austria, but even then I've really never seen one, uh, as that's where most of the Gruner in the world is grown, uh, and they also grow a lot of Riesling. Most other places don't really grow both grapes in sufficient quantity to really warrant a blend, at least not, a wide, not on a widespread basis. And Northeast Italy is about the only other place I wouldn't be surprised to see a blend like this, like say at a winery or two. Maybe Germany, but they're not known for their Gruner plantings. The wine isn't even on their website right now, so it may have been a one-off, especially considering it was like last November. I know the tasting room staff told me a little bit about it, but it was so long ago, I can't remember what exactly they told me. It seems like it was a wine they kind of played with and liked it, so they released it. I also took home a Cinso and a Tempranillo that day. I had tasted those, I had tasted those, so they were wines I enjoyed thoroughly at a later date. In other words, why they're not being reviewed. That Cinso was fire, as what well, the kids say or used to say. All right, let's get the stats for this wine. The 2021 Lost Draw Cellars Gemutlichkeit, uh, 30 bucks. Now I paid 27 with my industry discount. It's from the Texas High Plains. It's 63% Riesling, 37% Gruner Veltliner, and ABV is 12.3%. That's all I got on the wine. The name is a German word that is, quote, used to convey the idea or state of feeling of warmth, friendliness, and good cheer. That was from Wikipedia. 
The back label essentially says the same. Uh, script says, read the back label. It's a German word that describes the feeling of coziness and warmth. The tradition of family and fellowship is special to us at Lost Draw, and we hope the bubble is anyway. Oh, so anyway, now Google Translate says the word means coziness. Well, there you go. Also, friendliness, snugness, comfortableness, and unhurriedness. Other than that, I'm positive this saw no oak and was all stainless. Besides that, just making sense for a wine like this, Lost Straw's winemaking style is a fruit forward style that's not dominated by oak. And I'll attest to that from a few wines I've had from them and seeing the lack of oak in the actual winery. All right, let's get into the wine. All righty, I've been dying to try this. Boom, boom, boom. Did you like the Halloween episode? I had a lot of fun with it. I did take those two wines to the party, but nobody drank them. Even I didn't. I stuck with some cocktails, some beer, and then I even had a seltzer because I thought they were out of beer, and then I found more beer. It was a fun time. Alrighty. I'm happy that I am not in the restaurant industry anymore because, you know, things like that on a Saturday night were almost impossible for me to go to. Anyway. So color-wise, um, I mean, it's, just, it's a correct for, for the varietals. Um, it's actually kind of a medium color. Um, I would call it a medium straw. And I've got a little bit of kind of yellow on it, almost gold. Now, the wine's been out for probably a good half hour, 45 minutes. So it's not a refrigerator cold. You can see there's probably still condensation on it. There, when I did the bottle shot, I literally had just pulled the wine out of the fridge when I did the bottle shot today. So on the nose, it's definitely medium plus aromatics on this. It is youthful. There's no faults to it. I, I am kind of going through the grid, considering deductive tasting is what I didn't pass. And there's no evidence of any oak on this. I mean, just none. Not, I wouldn't even think that there was any type of used oak that it sat in there for a while. Considering it's a 2021 and I got it last year, even if it sat in a little bit of oak, it wasn't going to be significant as far as oxidation. So, I mean, it's really tart on the fruit. Like if I was just smelling this wine, I would think it was a European wine. So it's more like, it's also a bit of chalkiness to it. And to me, like just, just a, the sense of underripe fruit or tart fruit and chalkiness is what's coming through more than anything else. Not really specific fruits, but if I had to delve into it, which I do, there's a little lemon lime because lemon lime all the time, apple pear always there, but uh, I don't really get the apple pear, but I get lemon lime, get a little peach, a little orange, orange pith. Uh, there was something else I thought about, but now it's kind of escaped me. There's a little bit of kind of tropical fruit thing going on. Call a little bit of mango, papaya. That was, I think it was papaya, guava. There also, believe it or not, is a little bit of bazooka in this. And I haven't had bazooka in a while, but I did see some bazooka pops recently, considering this is around Halloween. It's not even Halloween yet. It's, uh, October 29th right now. In, during the day, by the way, in the morning, because... It's Sunday and it's football and I'm off today. So I got to get these recorded quick and I have more wine to pick up. So yeah, and it's very like, I wouldn't call it slate, but it's very steely. I don't, I don't feel like I get any type of uh, minerality, like, like actual like slate, like you would say from a German wine, but it was a bit of chalkiness to it. Like if I was, if this was a wine I was smelling, I wouldn't necessarily know where to take it, but reasoning probably would be at least in the neighborhood, um, specifically because of, of the fruits that was um, coming through. But I wouldn't think Riesling necessarily or Gruner because the two big things that tend to happen with either one of those wines is not present. However, with Gruner, the white pepper isn't always there and it isn't always the definitive thing to latch onto. Whereas with Riesling, I don't really get any TDN or um, petrol. Given that this is in Texas and it probably ripened out, even though the fruit smells underripe, it probably ripened out, which it can do. Um, that's probably why it's not in there. But let's get on the palate and see if it's there. There's this major like herbaceousness to it. It's honestly like arugula. 
which that's Gruner right there. I never get arugula from Gruner. I know it's a, I know it's a tasty note, but I never get it. And celery, I never get arugula and celery. Oh, and now because I'm thinking about it, it does kind of feel like white peppery. But Gruner is the is the lower percentage. It's the it's the 30 37 percent. But there's also like the savoriness, like um. Oh man. First of all. I did brush my teeth kind of recently. So let's do that. Um, really, really rinse out the mouth. But all those flavors are still there. And what, you know, I didn't get any. So having said that, it wasn't like I still tasted um, uh, like toothpaste or anything like that. Or whatever the flavors of the toothpaste, you know, the flavors of the toothpaste, which I can't remember what it is. Probably like mint or something like that. I don't get any mint. But yeah, we totally be confused. This is not a testable wine, by the way, at all. But I would totally be confused as to what this wine was. Um, but it's delicious. And it's it's definitely there's a rusticity to it. I feel like I feel like I'm tasting stems or tasting like sagebrush. Uh, not that sage personally, but like there's like a, a woodsiness to it. Um, which is something I associate with Texas wines a lot and also a couple other parts of the world. But yeah, it's a savory wine. It's not sweet by any means. This was fully fermented. You know how Riesling's can be sweet? Well, no, not all Riesling's sweet. I mean, just, just pick up some Australian Riesling. They're bone dry. This is a dry wine. And, you know, I talked about the, the fruit on the nose. The fruit doesn't really come through as much, but it comes through more like dried fruit, like like you dried the orange, like, like literally a dried orange. Um, yeah. Like all those fruits, those tropical fruits, those citrus fruits, it's like, you got them in a, like they, they, they're desiccated. They're dried out. Like they were intentionally dried and you're, they're, yeah, you've got that. So you had the flavor, but not the sweetness. This is a cool wine. I wonder if they, I wonder if it was just one of the scenes, they just had some grapes and they decided to play around with it. And, um, even though they might have been happy with the result, they didn't have an opportunity to make more. Or if they did make more, it's already out of stock from the 2022 vintage or something like that. But it's really nice. I like it. It's unusual. Um, yeah, 30 bucks. A lot of money to pay for, for a glass of wine. Or sorry, a bottle of well, glass of wine for sure. Bottle of wine. Um, I'll touch upon it next episode. Uh, you know, this is the reality of it. I don't know how much they made of this. This probably was a very low production wine. And that's... Part of the reason why wines in general are expensive, but Texas wines, because we have so many wineries in the state and they're all fighting for grapes and they don't all get a ton of grapes. I mean, literally, they don't get a, a lot of grapes necessary to make thousands and thousands of cases of each wine. Some of these wines are low production and they, uh, or thousands and yeah, thousands and thousands of cases. Um, so or tens of thousands of cases, so they don't have the economies of scale. So the prices are a little elevated. Is it worth $30? I think so. I think there's very, very good, uh, very high quality winemaking going on here. Is it unusual so for everybody? No, it's not. I think there's gonna be a lot of people that kind of go, oh, so, you know, first of all, they think Riesling, so they want something sweet. If they if they drink it, you have other people go, oh, Riesling is too sweet. And you have to go, no, 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 it's not always sweet. So it's, I don't think it's for everybody, but this is a cool wine. And I do feel like there's a touch of oxidation. I mean, like the barest hint, but this was under screw cap. And even though screw cap can, can mimic cork, I don't think they probably did that. I think it's just, it's just natural aging. Yeah, all those fruits, the orange, the lime, the lime and the lemon especially, feel like they just, they, they cut slices out and they, they dried them out. Um, the papaya and the guava more than the mango. But yeah, if you find a bottle of this, or if you happen to drop by and they, they made more, you should buy it. I know it's 30 bones, but I think just for the experience, you should do it and then maybe buy a couple more bottles. Anyway, that's going to do it for this episode. Um, if you enjoy what I'm doing, uh, please make sure you are clicking the like button and subscribing, subscribing to this uh, channel and tell all your friends. And then we will see you next time.